You are Locked On Wolverines, your daily podcast on the Michigan Wolverines, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Happy Friday. I would say you know what that means, but whole different situation. Given my health situation for the last week or so, two weeks actually, Locked On Wolverines podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it is your team usually every day, two days this week, one day last week, I believe is what it was. Uh, nonetheless, I'm your man on the ground, Isaiah Hole, publisher of Wolverines Wire through USA Today Sports Media Group. If you watched Wednesday's episode, I think hopefully I sound a lot better. I still am going through it a little bit, but I am 75% better as of last night. And that's good. So we should be able to start doing these again regularly. So we're getting to the mailbag, the Michigan mailbag, from December 9th, a good eight days ago. And I'm going to try to keep this relatively brief just for the sake of gaining strength, trying not to go all nuts. I have this in terrible order. <laughs> I did not. I started sorting this and then I just, I just stopped at some point. So that's, uh, that's great. But we're going to get it in the right order here. Let's just start with James Crudup at James Crudup 6. How much nefarious activity do you think went on? And he says yesterday, that means it's December 8th. You think it will get worse as time moves on? Is there a plausible way to police it? I don't even remember what you're talking about, unfortunately. What happened December 8th or December 9th, December 7th, whatever that day, whatever day that was? Um, I know this was before the Heisman. And this was after the Big Ten championship game. So I don't, I, unfortunately, unfortunately, my guy, I'm going to have to move on because I don't know, I don't remember what you're talking about. I was, I was certainly in bed for a very, very long time there. And that didn't bode very well for me. Uh, Josh Barr at Jadiki, let me see if I can find him here. Here we go. After the last two weeks, are you enjoying the amount of crow being eaten by the national media with regard to their Michigan and Harbaugh takes as much as I am? I mean, absolutely. Because, again, there was one team standing in the way. And a lot of these narratives, I think the great part of it is the flip side of James Franklin. Like, James Franklin, it's funny thing is because he signed his extension and it was like, oh, it's so well-deserved. And then he goes on and loses uh, his, you know, he loses to Michigan State. And it's like, so not deserved. What has he done? And uh, I, I, think it's, I think it's great, especially because of just – the fact that Michigan beat Ohio State the way it did, it beat uh, Iowa the way it did. Uh, it isn't like a narrative where it's like they don't deserve to be in the college football playoff. The early, I've only seen like one early score prediction from, and it was from ESPN right after the Big Ten championship game, and they predicted Michigan to beat Georgia and lose to Alabama. So I think that's fair, right? Like I think though, if, if Michigan beats Georgia, it certainly can beat Alabama. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, I would say it's easier said than done, but I don't necessarily think that Alabama's is loaded. I mean, we've seen games like, you know, the Auburn game where they weren't just firing on all cylinders. They still found a way to win, but Michigan, certainly, I think, if it can get there, has an opportunity. Uh, we'll see if that works out. My brother in metal, Michael Wolf at MWolf21. Michigan's 42-3 to victory over Iowa was the biggest loss for them since 1999. Does that say more about Michigan's dominance this year or more about Iowa? I think it says mostly about Michigan because Iowa's kind of in its upswing for the most part. Yeah, it lost a couple games. There's no shame in losing some of the games that it had lost. Um, I mean, aside from, wait, is there one that is a shame? No, because that was their third loss. They lost to Wisconsin and then they lost, and they lost to Purdue and Purdue just kind of had been doing that to people. I think it has everything to do with Michigan. And I mean, granted, Michigan really piled on, right? It was like 21-7 uh, it, with you know, a half to go. And then they made it 28, seven. And before you knew it, it was 42 to, I uh, sorry, 21, three. And then eventually 42 to three. I think it says a lot about Michigan, especially the patients offensively of breaking you down uh, because we've seen that kind of play out before, but doesn't, it isn't like 2018 where it's a situation where they can't, uh, they can't seem to, uh, uh, if they don't break you by the beginning of the second half that you can't, that they, won't be able to continue. Uh, I mean, honestly, this is like a better version in a lot of ways of what the 2018 team was uh, because the defense is more multiple. Uh, I think that uh, Iowa, as far as what it does, obviously offensively, it's putrid, but I mean, they dominated in all three phases. Iowa had the best special teams unit coming into the game and Michigan 
finished with the best special teams unit. So I think it says a lot more about Michigan. Jimmy Whitner at Jimmy Whitner one, which outcome was most satisfying to you? The Ohio state win or the Iowa win, the Ohio state win easily. I mean, it was the Iowa win was kind of like the, uh, it, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know if you're a Pistons fan or not or how old you are exactly, but, uh, it, to me, it was kind of like getting past the pay, you know, like the nets and the Pacers and those in 2004, you know, like getting past those two teams. The Nets was particularly satisfying because they were the roadblock the year before. And then the Pacers were a team they didn't do well against in the regular season. And, you know, they, they had the higher seed in the Eastern Conference and Michigan getting, not Michigan, Pistons getting past them. Uh, that was more satisfying than, say, Michigan, I keep on doing it, the Pistons getting past the Lakers. It was kind of similar, um, except for the Lakers were a team that were heavily expected to win. The Pistons were not. But that's kind of how it is to me where it was like, all right, they vanquished their biggest foe and now it's time, you know? Number two, what position do we still have to work to do uh, in recruiting the 2022 class? I know this is before early signing day. Um, obviously, you'd like to see more uh, more linemen. They might be able to address that. I'm still waiting on uh, Victor uh, Olisegun uh, to uh, or Olatuami. I can't, I have no idea how to pronounce his name. Olisegun is his first name. Olu Watam, what Olu Watimi, I think is how you say his last name. I, I, good thing for Carl Grappentine that he he's not a skill position player, so that uh, or a defensive player, so he's not going to be calling his name. Uh, but I think that will help shore it up because they've got two tackles in Alessandro Lorenzetti, and um, and I'm blanking on the other one suddenly. Oh, O'Connor Jones, and now you've got a guy in the middle. Yeah, I'd like a couple guards, but I mean, I'm not that concerned about the depth there right now because they've got so many guys that just haven't even played yet that are just kind of matriculating through the system. Um, uh, I'm thinking of, uh, obviously, you'd still like another linebacker or two. I mean, they've, they ended up finishing strong by keeping Deuce Spurlock. They got Jimmy Rolder. They added uh, Micah Pollard. Um, so I think that that's good. Uh, defensive end is obviously a position as well. I mean, they ended up getting Derek Moore, but uh, they lost Ethan Burke. It doesn't sound like Avante Henry uh, is going to be a part of the class. So maybe finding a defensive end, that would probably be the other one. Obviously, you don't need anyone in the secondary, any quarter, uh, quarterbacks or wide receivers. They've got one running back. I think that they would like to add another, but we'll see. Number three, what would you say is our major advantage slash weakness versus Georgia? Uh, Michigan's patience is probably the biggest advantage and the fact that they aren't going to get away. It's not like 2020 when they're like, all right, run game's not working. It's time to pass. They're not going to do that. Um, that. Obviously they'll have to be down like three scores before they would start doing that against Georgia. Uh, but I think the, the fact that the versatility, the personnel, the fact that Georgia can't just, it can, it's certainly going to try to take away the run. Michigan, I'm sure will have a couple different things schemed up. Uh, I'm sure that they'll have some misdirection like they'll try to run it between the tackles, but if they can't, uh, the, they'll try to test the edges and they'll try to do that in multiple ways. And then they'll try to hit you up. Uh, otherwise, uh, that's what they need. Cause that's kind of what Alabama did. I know people are really, uh, pointing to Alabama's pass game, but it was because they were able to run a little bit on Georgia that made it so that they could pass. So I think that that would be the big thing, um, is the, uh, the, the it's really difficult, I think, to game plan for Michigan's offense, especially personnel wise. Um, which is what I asked Jim Harbaugh when we had him on uh, December 5th or uh, yeah, December 5th, uh, in the bowl game press conference. Uh, but, uh, the weakness, not really sure because uh, like it's Michigan, I think stacks up pretty well. I don't think that there's anything glaring on either side. We'll just see. Um, obviously it's just Michigan's weakness is probably the same thing. They don't have like a go-to, you know, pass game situation uh just where it's like okay we can't run now we we're just going to need to pass here's our absolute go-to but i mean otherwise i think michigan it's pretty much strength on strength across the board there's really nothing that georgia is particularly bad at um and there's nothing that uh, michigan right now is particularly bad at so that's i think a, a good thing uh let's see here KRTF Farmer 84 besides quarterback, which offensive players will be most important against Georgia? Uh, I mean, obviously the running backs, the running game, that's the most important. And that really, again, that's that whole battery. It starts with the offensive front. Uh, the offensive front was probably more important, but they need to be able to get that first push. We talked to Blake Corum yesterday and he said like he had faith in the offensive line and getting to that second level. 
that's going to be easier said than done. But if they can do it, then that's then it's that's the game. I think if Michigan can Michigan's offensive line can get the running backs to the second level, even if those gains are only like four yards a carry, that game that's that's the game entirely. Like Michigan will be able to win if it is able to do that. Uh, I think it's that simple because I think Michigan's offense is at a high. I know it's not ranked as high as Georgia's. It's not scoring as much as Georgia's. I think Michigan's offense is better than Georgia's overall. So, and I think it's proven it because I went through, let me see if I can find this real, real fast. Probably not. I went through and did a, uh, see, I did an article yesterday on the Michigan players talking about the Georgia defense. And uh, so Georgia, uh, I, I did it by scoring defense. They're, they, they're allowing 9.5 points per game right now. Alabama obviously got, 41. They hadn't surrendered more than 17 points all season long. The offenses that they've faced as far as scoring offenses are 30th, 41st, 43rd, 55th, 58th, 59th, 78th, 95th, 109th, and 128th. So that's that's half of them are in the upper half, but most of them are in the middle. And then the other half, uh, third-ish are in the bottom. Uh, so there's that. Michigan has the 13th best scoring offense in the country which behind Alabama uh, is the second best scoring offense that Georgia will have seen. Now, Michigan's offense, uh, conversely, has gone up against the following scoring defenses. Wisconsin is sixth. Penn State is seventh. Iowa is 14th. Ohio State is 25th. Washington and Nebraska are tied for 38th. Rutgers is 57th. And Michigan State is 61st. And against those teams, put, uh, Michigan put up the second most points that Wisconsin surrendered, the fourth most that Penn State surrendered, the most that Iowa surrendered is same with Ohio State. The third most that Washington surrendered. The second most on Nebraska. Seventh most on Rutgers because we know how that game went. And the third most on Michigan State. So I think that that really bodes well for Michigan in that the offense has been very good. There's only been really one game in which the offense wasn't good at all. And that was the second half against Rutgers. You want to throw on Penn State. Sure, I'll, I'll allow that. Um I think it's going to be a very similar game to Penn State in that sense, but they still found a way to scheme Eric all open. So that's the important thing. Uh all right, Brandon at Brandon S616. Uh this one's a little outdated, but I'll answer it just because you, you're the leaders and best. Hope I didn't miss it, but if Gaddis were to leave, who would you choose on Michigan staff to replace him as OC? Uh, obviously, it doesn't sound like he's leaving all the head coaching jobs that he was interviewing for or interested in are, have been filled. But if someone was going to replace him, it would be, in my eyes, Matt Weiss. Then you'd have two Baltimore guys. But, I mean, it was, Matt Weiss has been all up and down the uh, offensive spectrum and at uh, Baltimore, and I think he would be the logical conclusion uh, there. I think that might be it. Because, wait, did Jonathan, I don't think Jonathan Joseph asked one. I'm just double-checking since I didn't paste things correctly here. I got too excited to get into this. Doesn't look like you did. All right, so let's move on. We'll continue here momentarily. But listen, this is it. This is the putt to win the tournament. If you sink it, the championship is yours. But on your backswing, your hat falls over your eyes. Is this how you're running your business? Poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated finance software? To see the full picture, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. Um, all right, here's the thing. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system to empower your growth with visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and more. NetSuite is everything you need to grow all in one place. With NetSuite, you can automate your processes and close your books in no time while staying well ahead of your competition. 93% of surveyed businesses increase their visibility and control after upgrading to NetSuite. Over 27,000 businesses already use NetSuite, and right now, through the end of the year, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind financing program to those ready to upgrade at netsuite.com slash locked on. So head over to netsuite.com slash locked on for the special end-of-year financing on the number one financial system for growing businesses. That's netsuite.com slash locked on. All right, here's the other thing. BetOnline.ag, they have you covered for all of for a full season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football season continues as we're on starting bowl games tonight so that's actually happening bet online remains your number one spot for all of the sports action this season head over to the new updated desktop or mobile website sign up today put in the promo code lockdown to receive your 50 percent welcome bonus with your first deposit from basketball football nhl boxing ufc right to your favorite vegas casino games 
Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. Bet online, where the game starts. All right, let's continue here. This one's going to be pretty much no order, so it'll be a little bit easier for me to navigate here. After now that I'm sitting upright, this is not this has not been something I've done much in the last uh, couple weeks. I did yesterday. Yesterday, I, I, I had a I, I had already pre-purchased a ticket like a weeks before to go see Spider Man, and that was incredible. It was far exceeded my expectations. Then I had a press conference afterwards. Came back and worked and all of that. So that was kind of somewhere during Spider Man. I was like, I feel pretty much close to normal now, except for just in congestion. So, just letting you guys know. Anyway, let's get on to our Victor's Valiant, Jim at Jim in the North. Harbaugh is the lowest buyout in the Big Ten and one of the lowest salaries. I'm worried after the season and all the crap he has taken, he might go to the NFL or retire, leave on a high note, maybe take a more family-friendly job. Uh, circumstance, do you think it's a possibility? I don't know. I, I mean, he, I don't see him leaving under any circumstance unless Michigan was just for some reason like, you know, I don't know why, but that's it. Uh, will the 24 day layover cause malaise? No, I don't think so either. This team is not built that way. Um, you know, maybe some other teams I'd say so, but not this one. I mean, it's this, this is the same team that beat Iowa 20, uh, sorry, 42 to three when everyone was saying, look, look, look out for a meltdown. Nope. No meltdown or letdown rather look for a letdown. Think we can run on Georgia. I don't know if that's a question or a statement. Your guess is as good as mine though. Um, so far, they've been able to run on almost everybody. They ha did have their issues against Michigan State. After that, they've been able to run on everybody. I mean, keeping in mind, Ohio State had the number 11 run defense when Michigan played them. A everyone had said, oh, they shored it up. Ohio State had shored it up. Michigan is not going to be able to run on them. 297 yards later, then again, they weren't really able to run on Iowa very much. I mean, they did. I mean, they broke a big, big one. I think that's all it's going to take is breaking a couple big ones. You know, and when you can't do it, then finding other things to do. And I think that's the good thing with the offense, right? Uh, between the flea flickers that they've been using, the end arounds, the, you know, the lateral pass, like the Donovan Edwards, they, they're going to have so they have so much in their arsenal. Finishing out from Jim to answer your question from the last podcast. My username is inspired by Game of Thrones and I live in northern Michigan. Perfect, man. I can't tell you how much I love Game of Thrones, I, except for season eight. I like the first couple episodes of season eight, but I love Game of Thrones. Anyway, Zach at Zach Woodruff three. Any chance this coaching staff remains intact for another season? How do you see the Cade slash JJ dynamic working next season? Honestly, the latter part, I think it could work out exactly the same as it has. Maybe JJ plays a slightly more prominent role, but I, I don't see any reason necessarily. I mean, K JJ is happy right now. He, he knows his time is coming. He'll be a little bit more experienced. I could see him getting like a couple drives here and there. A little bit, uh, I think it's, uh, I, I don't think that it's necessarily a situation where you're, you know, pulling him out for, you're pulling Kate out for one play. I think you can manage that kind of similarly. And I think Cade is fine with that as well. Uh, as long as you're not stunting your own drives. Um, as far as the coaching staff, it certainly seems like it. I, I, I would be, I can say I would be surprised because, it, you know, all these guys are going to be hot commodities now. but. It seems like teams like Ohio State don't tend to have that type of turnover. Um, Alabama does usually because guys become head coaches. I think that I could see this kind of, this crew running it back one more time, and I would imagine that the assistants are all going to kind of get raises. So, Jacob Shaveria, Jacob one seven two one thirty nine fifty. If you didn't work in the media, would you be attending the national championship game as a fan if Michigan were to make it? Uh, I'll answer that first question. Probably not because I don't know that I would, depending on what my job would be, um, and I, Lord knows living in the state of Michigan, uh, where I, um, where a film degree doesn't really go that far as I learned before I got this job. It's, um, despite being a Michigan degree, I wasn't making a lot of money, so I'm not really sure that I'd be able to afford it. I'd probably would watch it with some friends at, you know, at their house or, at home or something like that. What's the most you've known someone to spend on a single ticket for any game? Any tips on convincing my wife to let me spend 1500 on a ticket? Um, 
the tip that would be like, hey, you know, this is, you know, this this doesn't exactly happen, right? Like, if if we're talking like a second championship or a third, okay, fine, I'll stay at home. But like, you know, it's been twenty something years. This under it's pretty close as far as it's in Indianapolis. You can make that trip in a day if you're in Michigan. Uh, as far as most I know, someone has spent on a single ticket. I don't really know, to be honest. I'm sure I have some. You know some people have gone to like the Super Bowl. I know some people who are going to the Orange Bowl and have spent like seven hundred. That's more than like I thought I was insane for spending three hundred and something dollars on a tool ticket back in uh two thousand or something like that. Whatever year that Ladderless came out, they played at the State Theater. I spent like three hundred dollars from a from an after seller. Rob Anto at Rob Anto one. Other than Aiden Haskins of Astartus, who would you who else would you expect to leave for the NFL? Um a couple guys it seems like potentially could go. Eric All supposedly is one that could potentially test those waters. Daxton Hill obviously is another. David Ajabo uh is the uh the other one. Uh where that one I, if I was David Ajabo, I would I would go. I wouldn't even think twice about it. He's some of these projections have him as a top ten pick. You gotta go. As much as it yeah, it'd be great to have him back. Sorry, man. No, you have to go. Uh, Zach Van Lenty at Lenty Zach. Glad you're feeling better. Definitely premature there since this was last week, but uh, yeah, as I sniffle. Anyway, how epic would a Hutchinson Heisman House commercial be? Unfortunately, he didn't win the Heisman, but that would be sweet. But I mostly wanted to answer this. What five plays from this season would you put in a hype video for next year? Uh, so name a, basically name a Hassan Haskins hurdle with the Nebraska one being the, probably the most prominent one. And then Ohio State's behind it, but I'll put all the hurdles in one category. So that's one. Eric All touchdown would be uh, number two. Uh, I would probably throw in Blake Corum long run against Ohio State as number three. Um, just trying to think back to some of these other games. If they would have won Michigan State, this one doesn't count, but if they would have won against Michigan State, the uh, Andrell Anthony run would be number four, but it's not. So let's think of another one. Probably Blake Corum touchdown against Washington with the peace sign uh, would be number four and number five. I mean, I got to get a defensive highlight in there somewhere. Uh, just a, probably a collection of uh, of sacks, so probably all Aiden against Ohio State. And a lot of those were were the, um, the offense. But I'm Patman at the underscore GD Pat underscore Patman. What do you make of Ohio State hiring Oklahoma State's defensive coordinator? I think it's not it I think they're number gazing to be honest and I I understand it's a, it's a good looking group right like so let's look at what Oklahoma State's defense is um if I can get my internet to work which doesn't seem to be a case all right so Oklahoma State finished the season with a number 3 total defense 278.4 yards uh per game rushing defense Number five, they allow 91.15. Uh, they have an average attempts, let's see, 432 average attempts against them. So, I mean, that's a pretty good metric, 2.74 yards. Uh, but uh, passing defense, I think, is probably where it comes into play a little bit more. They're number 12. They allow 187.2 yards per game. Here's the thing for me, though, with, with Oklahoma State is that them being in the Big 12, and I know I'm saying something that a lot of other people are saying, but them being in the Big 12, they are going up against mostly aerial attacks, mostly like air raid style. I mean, not exclusively. And they're doing, they did really good, obviously, in that. Uh, but at the same time, like if you're, if, if this is your reaction to Michigan, I don't necessarily, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. If this is your reaction to how, what you were able to stop, you know, what you did against Michigan and what you weren't, were and weren't able to do, I don't think it's going to work. Right. Um, they did, they did give, I mean, really the, their only two bad games were, uh, Oklahoma gave up 441 yards. They won that game, gave up 33 points. Um, and, uh, they had 189 rushing yards allowed. Iowa state who had 307 passing yards on them. Couple teams had ran over for a hundred over a hundred yards. TCU had 133. Texas had 138. Tulsa had 123. Southwest Missouri State had 102. 
um, yards per play. TCU is the the top there at five points. Oh, sorry, six point three two yards per play. Iowa State, Texas, they're all up there in yards per play. Um, the the only team that really didn't do well at all was Texas Tech. Other and that really kind of drove their numbers down because they only got one hundred and eight total yards. Kansas and West Virginia also didn't do very well, but those aren't exactly really good teams. Here's my thing. He runs more of a 4 2 5. That's going to stop spread offenses and the types of things you see in the Big 12. It's probably not going to work against this Michigan offense as it currently stands, um, especially if the offensive line is being more physical. So it's kind of like we'll see how it works out for him, but I don't know that it will or not. It's not who I would probably go after. I don't know who I would go after, but I'd probably try to hit someone. Someone that's like Brent Pry. I know you weren't going to get Brent Pry because he's now the head coach at Virginia Tech, but someone like him is more likely to be able to stop things, right? Like you have to find a, a defensive guy who's going to work against the style of play that you're going to see. And there aren't a lot of spread teams in in the Big Ten. So we'll see. Jacob Hemminger at Hemminger Jacob. Less question, more something I thought you'd find interesting. And this was his, his older tweet. He said, another way to view how much more dominant Michigan has been compared to the other playoff teams. Against the spread, average cover margin, uh, points per game, strength of, and strength of schedule. Michigan's 11-2. and two. They're averaging 10.6 ahead of the, uh, the spread and uh, 21st strength of schedule. Georgia's 8-5, 6.2 uh, points over the, cover, uh, the average cover. 20th in strength of schedule. Cincinnati is 8 and 5.36, 87th strength of schedule. And Alabama 7 and 6 against the spread, negative 2.5 against uh, in the point cover margin, and fourth strength of schedule. So interesting. I think it all kind of feeds in together, together, right? Michigan has a real chance to upset this idea of SEC dominance all in one year. Uh, we say that, though, and Ohio State certainly had its opportunity and took advantage of it in 2014, and yet they didn't I mean, they did get the the credence, right? But only them, not the rest of the Big Ten. So this is Michigan's opportunity, and uh, we'll see how the rest of the SEC teams do as well, uh, especially against Big Ten teams in bowl games. Old writer from Wolverine's Wire, Brandon Knapp at BNAP Blogs. I remember your comments on Georgia fans. Which fan base reactions would you enjoy most after losing to Michigan if Michigan can beat Georgia on New Year's Eve? Ohio State or Georgia? I know Ohio State already happened, but will a win over Georgia be sweeter? No, it's still Ohio State. Like, yeah, Georgia fans are obnoxious. You know, like I've talked about, you know, listening in on Sirius XM and hearing some of those guys call in and be like, Stetson Bennett is the second coming of Fran Tarkenton and stuff like that. Just like this level of delusion going into the, uh, the SEC championship game. I remember listening in the end. Uh, I think it was the same caller too. He was part of Mark Packer's smack pack. Just talking about how it was a coronation. Finally being able to get over the Alabama hump before the game was played and it didn't go that way. So, um, I, but it's still Ohio state because I mean, they're still melting down. If Michigan beats Georgia. They'll continue to melt down. If Michigan wins the whole national championship, they'll continue to melt. Like, whereas when Ohio State won in 2014, I feel like people were just like, in Michigan, we're like, well, that sucks, but okay. You know what I mean? They won't treat it that way. Michigan State would be just as fun because they'll, they'll be saying 37-33 over and over again as if it matters to any single Michigan fan. Adam Casel at Adam underscore Casel. In addition to Caden Ronnie Bell, who do you see as leaders on next year's team? Um... Let's let me think here. I'm trying to think through. Obviously, yeah, you just nailed two of them for sure. Ronnie's the the big one. Um, Chris Hinton, I could see being one of those guys. Um, let's see. Mike Sainer still certainly would be one of those guys. I could see Blake Corum being a junior leader type, and. Uh, figure you got to have an offensive lineman or you know in there somewhere I'm just trying to think of who it would be I mean maybe it would be Ryan Hayes but I know he hasn't necessarily seemed like stood out to me and like exuding those qualities and but that's just in press conferences so I don't know those would be the guys that I would have now JT at Vaunted JT after watching the Alabama beatdown of Georgia I seen that they were susceptible to the pass do you see Andrew Anthony uh 
being able to rise to the occasion like he did against Michigan State. He always seems to be able to make contested catches. We've seen his speed. Why has he not been given more looks? Well, I know he got a little bit injured, a little, a little banged up in the following game. Um, but, you know, all of this stuff should be healed. I would imagine that, I mean, they, they have to know, right? Like, hey, we need to add to our passing arsenal. But, I mean, they've just got so many guys, right? I mean, I, I'd like to see Andrell get, you know, play a part. He certainly, if, if you need a contested catch guy, he should be hit, be it. But, uh, obviously, I think they'll also use speed as far as, like, Roman Wilson, and and we'll see. But, yeah, it would be nice to see him play a bit of a part, too. Okay, I'm at Keith1906, or at Keith underscore 1906 to close out segment two. What are the coaches saying about Jalen Harrell? He's impressed me the last two games with his play. Uh, actually, we haven't heard any of the coaches say anything about Jalen Harrell, but yeah, I agree. I'm not going to expound on that. Anyway, all right, you listen to podcasts for the power of knowledge. You should switch to Boost Mobile for the power of saving money because with Boost, you get the power of a free 5G phone so you can listen to all the latest episodes. The power of three unlimited data lines for $30 a month per line so your family can harness all that brain power too and the power of one of america's largest 5g networks so you can do it all at the speed of 5g with all that money you'll save and all that knowledge you'll gain just how powerful will you become switch to boost mobile and find out get a free samsung galaxy a32 5g when you switch to one of america's largest 5g networks more power to save boost mobile free phone limited to new customers and one per line additional restrictions apply offers coverage not available everywhere for all phones and networks see boostmobile.com for details now the other thing that uh need to tell you about obviously is boost bar not yeah built bar boost bar wow <laughs> the going from boost mobile to built bar very confusing for for this person uh built bar y'all know much i love built bar uh, i have multiple i'm about to buy more boxes right because i'm out of my f- current favorite coconut brownie chunk uh, I've still got a couple peanut butter brownies left because I've been able to slow jam the news as far as those are concerned. They sent me a sample of one with a, with a, my mystery box per, per, uh, purchase that was like a caramel almond, which was insane. It was so good, but it wasn't on their site when I went to go buy a box. I need to go. But anyway, if you don't know what Built Bar is, it is a protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. It's high protein, low calorie, low carb. I adore it. I will certainly have a Built Bar before I leave the house tonight. Um... It, they, they're just so good. I put so much, I, I don't know how many purchases I've made. I've made a lot. <laughs> so dozens upon dozens upon dozens with my own money. And they've sent me samples here and there. And you know, it's, it's still, it's something that I believe in. And I'm telling you, if you haven't tried it, you should go to built.com, put in promo code locked 15 to get 15% off your next order. That's built.com promo code locked 15. All right, we've got seven more here. Uh, at starting with Kyle R. Dietrich Larrabee at Larrabee underscore Kyle. Can you pump it up? Your early score prediction and why? Thanks. Hashtag go blue. Uh, I don't really have an early score prediction yet. I do have a gut feeling that Michigan wins. Um, can't really rationalize it going through the numbers. There's nothing in there that tells me that it should happen. It's just I think this team is playing together and for each other i think uh georgia will be in somewhat disarray i guess i'll give you something now i'll say 24 to 17 i think that it will be a very close game i think michigan pulls out i couldn't i wouldn't be surprised if any of the four things happened right close game either way blowout either way wouldn't be surprised but uh I'll, i'll stick with a close michigan win right now big 10 fan at big 10 fanatic Given Georgia's front seven and their ability to stop the run, Young had to throw for 421 and three TDs to beat Georgia. Will we see more JJ in order to beat this team? Kate is good. Few mistakes, 190 yards on average a game with one TD, but we're going to need him to have the game of his life to beat Georgia. Kate has a ceiling that JJ most likely doesn't, and if Kate isn't able to put together that kind of game, we must see to win. How early could we see JJ, or will we keep them off balance by running a two QB system the entirety of the game? We'll probably keep them off balance. I wouldn't, again, like, remember, like, there was all the talk. I mean, Joel Clack came on this very show and said, Michigan's not going to be able to beat Ohio State without J.J., and then they did. I don't think it's necessarily that. I think Michigan will still try to play its game and assume, like, that we can be more physical in the trenches, is what they'll say. They'll say, we'll be more physical in the trenches. And as good as you guys are up front, we'll be better. And they'll try to run, and I'm sure, again, I think that the game plan will be somewhere between Penn State and Wisconsin. 
Wisconsin is equally probably similar as in not necessarily in defensive style, but probably as far as the holes closing, I think it's one of those things where they might not give up a lot of big runs. Uh, but uh, I, I, I mean, then again, Iowa hadn't until that point, right? Iowa hadn't been giving up big plays and then Michigan hits them with a couple different things and changes things up and suddenly there you go. So no, I don't agree that Kate has to have the game of his life. I just think that all 11 have to play together and the, the coaching and the scheme has to be smart. See Henry at Chen 13, 313, 313, probably Detroit. What worries or concerns do you have about Georgia? Uh, how does our offense match up with their defense? Is team speed an issue? No, I definitely don't think team speed is an issue, um, personally. Uh, as far as I've already addressed kind of the weaknesses and whatever. Offense against defense, again, again I, we'll just have to see if the offensive line can get pushed. That's the entire game. Who's replacing Courtney Morgan and, and in that regard, why the change? Courtney Morgan left of his own volition to reunite with Kalen DeBoer, who was at San Jose State, I believe, and that's where Morgan was before. Uh, so that's why the change, uh, it certainly sounds like Albert Karshnia, who is a Michigan graduate. He was around the program for several years as a grad assistant. I don't know what he was after that. Uh, Albert's a great dude. I know him pretty well. Uh, so I would imagine he would be that guy. Uh, but, uh, we'll see if they add a couple people or if it's just Albert or if it's someone else, we'll see. Jingling Jen Eric at ERKJ72. And I just answered this. He says losing Courtney Morgan seems like a huge blow when he leads enemy to may replace him. I was supposed to read both those at back to back. Didn't work out that way. Big champ Will from Michigan at from underscore burner. So the season has been unbelievably awesome. Obviously, the narrative has switched, but how sustainable is this going into next year? Also, wasn't the Big Ten schedule going to get redone so we don't play MSU? At MSU again next year, thought we were returning to alternating OSU and MSU. Yes, they're going to switch. They just haven't. It's not reflected on the schedule yet. Indiana will be at Indiana. Michigan State will be in Ann Arbor next year. And as far as sustaining, I mean, you need the leadership. And I think that starts with Caden and Ronnie Bell, right? They have to continue that same, you know, keeping the same level of energy and intensity. And uh, I think that you've got the offensive linemen that can be physical enough, uh, which is the good news. Because even though you lose a bunch of guys, I, I, you know, we'll see if they get uh, Oluwatimi um, to, to be the new center. Um, but then they've still got some guys, Carson Barnhart, Trente Jones, Obviously, still got Zach Zinter and Trevor Keegan and Ryan Hayes. So I think that they, they've got a lot of guys that can really still play pretty big roles here. But we'll see what happens. But it's really going to be about uh, sustaining that type of mentality and then trying to find a pass rush. Uh, we've seen a lot of really good things from Mike Morris and Taylor Upshaw down the stretch. We'll see if that can continue. Start getting Braden McGregor and Jalen Harrell and some of these other guys going and uh, hope that it's kind of like... Uh, like you used to see, right, where it went from, like, Chris Wormley, Taco Charlton, to Rashawn Gary, Chase Winovich, to Aiden and Quiddy, to Aiden and Ajabo. M might not be as dominant, right, <laughs> because this is, like, some of the best we've seen ever. But, uh, I mean, it, you've, I think you might be showing things up more in the middle and the back end that will help if the pass rush isn't quite as dominant. So that's the good news. Matthew Piotrowski at drummerboy4877. What is the deal with all the players holding chairs up on the sideline? I don't know. I keep on meaning to ask, so I'll try to ask that when we get down to Fort Lauderdale. So uh, we'll see if I can get some answers there. Finishing us out, Gary Moore at gdog4um7. Can you name a few guys who haven't played much or at all who might make a splash next year? Um, I mean, we've seen pretty much all the receivers. I can see... See Tavi or Dunlap kind of getting some run at running back, especially if depending on what happens to with uh, if they're able to get the Diamante Trey in them. Um, try to think here. I mean, uh, we'll definitely see more Rod Moore. I mean, we're going to have to see some other safeties potentially, whether it's Makari Page or um, Jordan Morant. Uh, Quentin Johnson just kind of there. Um, I, I, I would. I would imagine mostly it's going to be though. Like I can see a lot of these new freshmen, Derek Moore, being a dude, right? Uh, Darius Clemens being a dude. I think the the guys they added on signing day are pretty incredible. Tyler Morris being a dude. 
So we'll see. But yeah, I don't have a very good beat on that right now. Hopefully find out more during the bowl game. All right, that'll do it for us today. We'll be back next week, hopefully with a full complement of shows, uh, which will be the last before they start taking place. Well, last week and next week, and then, yeah, then I think then they'll all start taking place in Florida. So we'll see if that can we can make that happen. Anyway, that'll do it. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for watching and or listening. Peace. <laughs>